cycles is the reason I had to erase all references, or I tried to erase all references to seniors in my mailing about this event because Emily is a junior. Um, <laughs> Um, Emily worked with Dr. Brian Sheeran on a project called The King is Lovesick for His Minion, Homoeroticism and Politics, and Christopher Marlowe's Edward II. Thanks, Emily. Hello. Um, as she said, my name is Emily Nichols, and today I will be discussing the research behind my paper, The King is Lovesick for His Minion, Homoeroticism and Politics, and Christopher Marlowe's Edward II. The text at the center of my work is, of course, Edward II by Christopher Marlowe, a Renaissance history play following the reign of medieval king Edward II, and the story of his court's, re court's rebellion against him, which eventually led Edward to become the first English monarch to be forced to abdicate the throne since Norman conquest in 1066. The story opens with Piers Gaveston, King Edward's primary lover, reading a letter from Edward calling him home after the former king's death. The choice of Hilton and Gaston for introducing the political tensions which eventually, oh, the political tensions underlying the play is fitting as his return to England at the beginning of the play sparks the political tensions which eventually cause Edward's forced abdication. Gaston's return to England isolates Edward from his court who, led by Mortimer Jr., eventually kills Gaston and overthrows the king. This thesis will also incorporate an analysis of contemporary primary sources, including Marlowe's textual source, Raphael Palanchet's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, uh, as well as other literary depictions of King Edward II, including John Taylor's sonnet in A Brief Remembrance of All the English Monarchs, and Michael Drayton's depiction of Gaveston in The Legend of Piers Gaveston, to reveal the distinct interests of Marlowe as a playwright engaging in these topics. I have focused my attention in my, oh, in my research on um, the intersection of Clay's depiction of homoeroticism and the politics. Um, in doing so, I have been paying particular attention to Marlowe's depiction of Gaston and his return to England and the court's reaction to it. In my research, I wanted to um, to ask to what extent Marlo mingles the political and sexual, particularly the homoerotic, I also wanted to ask how Gaveston specifically embodies this intersection in the play. My answer to this question was the following. The conflict surrounding Gaveston's return to the court reveals most aptly the overwhelming connection between sexuality and politics, as his decisions, relationships, and the antagonism with which the court responds to them are all tinted with expressions of both. It seems appropriate then that Marlowe's depiction of sexuality, particularly in his portrayal of Gaston and Edward, is where the political plot of the play gets its footing. The political and the sexual become increasingly inseparable until it culminates with Edward's execution. Uh, the scholarly discussion, more broadly, of the intersection of politics and sexuality has focused intently on whether or not Edward's court had any sort of homophobic inclinations. That is to say, whether or not Edward's peers were uncomfortable with his sexual interests in other men. While some scholars argue for this case, others opt to instead focus on the peers' complaints of Gaveston's unwarranted favor and reward status. While this is an interesting conversation, in my own work, I wanted to focus more on how the intertwining of sexuality and politics is fundamental to the conflict between Edward and his court. Marlowe's depiction of Edward and Gaveston's relationship is rather explicitly romantic and sexual. As Kate, scholar Kate Hayam notes, in writing Edward II, Marlowe, quote, instigated a shift in the understanding of Edward and Gaveston's relationship from cautious ambiguity to a consensus about its sexual nature. Though this reading of their relationship is generally accepted, there is plenty of debate among scholars about how the portrayal is done. One topic of current contention is whether or not Marlowe connects transvestism and cross-dressing in the homoerotic desire of his characters. Scholar Matthew DeLillo argues in his article that Marlowe relies on typical period stereotypes, primarily transvestism, to cope his character's sexual desire. He then asserts that using these stereotypes allows Marlowe to complicate his depiction of sexuality in the play. This puts him at odds with previous scholars like Jonathan Goldberg and Jonathan Crew, both of whom argue that readings of sexuality in Edward II that center on connections to transvestism are inherently reductive. Most notably, Goldberg argues that positioning homosexuality in Marlowe's text as connected to cross-dressing reduces it down to merely a failed heterosexuality. 
This more fundamental discussion of how and why Marlowe depicts his character's desires in specific ways informs my reading of the text. For example, Gaveston's call on images of a, quote, lovely boy in Diane's shape, end quote, in Act 1 not only reflects Lilith's arguments surrounding Marlowe's stereotypical images of homoerotic desire, and alludes to the theatrical practice of boy actors filling the roles of women on stage, but also creates a parallel to Edward's abdication speech in Act 5. These moments reflect a feeling of performativity that connects Gaveston's sexual desire and Edward's political identity as king. These parallels and meaning points are what drive my inquiry. There is a similar political tension that appears in both Marlowe's play and Raphael Hollenshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, one of my primary sources. In the play, Edward and his court, made up of members of noble families, are in conflict over whether the king's power should be sent, where the country's power should be centered. Edward constantly complains of being overruled by his peers, angry that the court challenges his power as king. Edward desires a more centralized monarchy, wanting to bring power to himself and his closest advisors on Gaveston. The peers around him are angry for the opposite reasons, as they see Edward closing the circle of influence around figures such as Gaveston as a threat to their own power. Um, this conflict between monarch and court is present in Hollandshed, who shares the anxiety of the court. He remarks how Edward, quote, began to have his nobles in no regard, let nothing by their instruction, and take small heed unto the good government of the Commonwealth, end quote. It is clear that Hollandshed feels that Gaveston's influence towards Edward turned Edward away from the court and caused a consolidation of power in the king alone. Another text written after Marlowe's play in 1618. John Taylor's sonnet sequence, A Brief Remembrance of All the English Monarchs, expresses a similar sentiment when he explicitly connects Edward's relationship with Gaveston and his death. In the sonnet, Edward complains to Gaveston that, quote, my friendship to thee scarce left me a friend, end quote. His relationship with Gaveston is portrayed as isolating his connections in his court, including his wife and peers. The sonnet ends with a surprising concluding couplet when Taylor writes, quote, a red hot spit in my bowels through did gore, such misery no slave endured more. End quote. This depiction of Edward's death explicitly connects it to the perceived shift Edward makes away from his court towards a more centralized view of power. Not only after the mere existence of historical narratives such as Taylor and Hollandshed reflect a shift towards a more concrete understanding of national identity, the desire for a definitive national history aligned heavily with a growing sense of nationalism in the 16th century. This ever-increasing nationalism is reflected most interestingly in the format of both books. Uh, the reign of a single monarch is depicted in each chapter. The decision to divide the nation's history into the reigns of individual monarchs heightens its monarchical undertones. More than that, at the center of Marlowe's play is the controversial couple of Edward and Gaveston. The cultural perception of the precise nature of Edward's relationship with his male favorites, including Gaveston himself, is, um, has, been, has changed over time. Yet, Marlowe makes clear decisions that indicate an explicit romantic and sexual dynamic in his interpretation. Thus, in order to examine their relationship in Marlowe's text, analyzing the cultural conversations surrounding homoeroticism and sex between men of his time became pertinent. An understanding of Edward and Galveston's relationship is explicitly discussed in Michael Drayton's 1595 poem, The Legend of Piers Galveston, an account of Galveston's life told from his own perspective. In the poem, Galveston talks about his early relationship with Edward by saying, quote, this Edward in the April of his age, whilst yes, yet the ground sat on his father's head, my joke with me, his Ganymede, his page, end quote. The allusion to Ganymede in this section is interesting. The story centered on the mythological young cupbearer of Jove, the Roman equivalent of Zeus, was deeply associated with homosexual desire in the tradition of pederasty. It is a story that Marlowe will continually pick up on in using his works, particularly in Edward II himself, where Edward's wife, Queen Isabella, calls on it to verbalize her frustration with Gaveston's interruption of her marriage. For example, when she complains, quote, never doted Jove on Ganymede so much as he on curse of Gaveston. Though Drayton's reference to Ganymede calls into question the extent to which their relationship is innocently platonic on the surface, Gaveston appears to be depicting it as such. His reference again when Drayton writes, quote, some slanderous tongues and spiteful manner said that here I lived in filthy sodomy, and that I was Queen Edward, King Edward's Ganymede, and to this sin he was enticed by me. Here, Ganymede is associated explicitly with sodomy, unlike the more platonic leading reference in the first quote. This tension of seemingly contradictory uses of Ganymede in Drayton's work representing 
acceptable depiction, both acceptable depictions of bonds between men and unacceptable sexual relationships is tricky to decipher and complicates both this depiction and Marlowe's. Another interesting interest of the interweaving of sexuality and politics is a single phrase that Marlowe uses throughout the play, minion. Core figures such as Mortimer Jr. and Ed Edward's most vocal opponent call on it often to refer to Gaston and vent their frustrations surrounding him as Queen Isabella does with references to Gandhi. Minion refers to the male favorite or lovers of particularly powerful individuals such as princes or kings. Kittingham fleshes out this definition, noting it emerged from the French word mignon and eventually took on sexual connotations. The word itself then sits at the intersection of the political and sexual in its definition. Thus, Marlowe loves to use it in relation to Gaston, who embodies the same convergence. For example, when Norbert Sneer famously reflects on the history of powerful men keeping male letters, he says, quote, let, out, let him without controlment have his will. The mightiest king have had their minions, end quote. Going on to list male historical figures, who have had male lovers like Edward, indicating that they have no issue with this. The moment, this moment is Marlowe's way of explicitly codifying a relationship between Edward and Gaston by connecting it to a historical precedent and indicating the sexual use of the word minion. The ambiguous nature of minion itself as encompassing both political and sexual transgression makes the court use, court's use of this term particularly illustrative of other anxieties that are set with their political worries and their underlying attitudes towards Edward's sexuality. Eventually, the court appears to get their wish, and they do kill Gaston, but their discontent and anger with Edward continues, and he is deposed. It is clear that their upset with the king ran deeper than just disconnect, than just discontent with his particular choice and companionship with Gaston. The tensions which Gaston represents continues to influence the underbelly of the political conflict. The culminating moment of the play, the execution of the titular King Edward II, is one that has produced a dynamic range of scholarly discussion and debate. Due to notorious in six stage directions, the exact way Marlowe envisions Edward ex Edward's execution to be staged is unknown. The ambiguity has spawned a spirited debate on whether he intended to adapt the infamous death scene from Hollingshed's Chronicles, as Hollingshed describes, quote, they thrust up into his body a hot spit, end quote, burning out his bowels. Stepping on further, the apparent fixation on the part of scholars surrounding the specifics of this scene brings out the importance of the overlap of Sexuality and politics at the heart of the play as Edward's political execution has, in one way or another, profoundly sexual under overtones. This dynamic interplay of politics and sexuality itself creates and defines the conflict of Edward II. Thank you. Oh, there's a wireless. Oh, 
for it. He sees himself as part of that project too. Um, well, I guess the, the active mining industry play itself also is in that, the writing of the historical narrative of England in this play, and also the tension between Edward and his court, specifically um, the court wanting to keep power and sort of more medieval sex with the sort of larger court and Edward sort of consolidating that power more in himself, which was sort of common with the growing centralized monarchies at the time of Marla. Really, really interesting. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to invite Dr. Sheeran up now to give you your board and your soul to say if you get to say a few things about working with you, um, to give you the resume that you'll we'll get to there next year at graduation. <laughs> Congratulations, Emily. 